Welcome to this week's episode of Kent's Garage. I'm still working on my 1976 240D. If you recall, I'm trying to do a cosmetic engine and engine compartment restoration. I want this thing to look pretty, okay? But at the same time, I'm gonna be doing some maintenance that I know needs to be done on this engine. And we'll be going over that in future episodes. So we're gonna keep working on this car, but I wanted to give you a brief update for what I've been doing this past week. I had to bring out the paintbrushes. I had to do the old artist trick. Now, I've done this on a lot of cars, starting back to the first car I bought when I was 13 years old. I got out there and started painting it because it didn't look very pretty, particularly the rust holes in my old 34 Ford, okay? But I mentioned that not all satin blacks are created equal, and that's really the color that I want to use in and around the engine compartment. I want not a gloss black. Gloss black shows too many flaws and it just kind of jumps out at you. Once again, I mentioned a couple episodes ago that we're going to attack each thing that the eye goes to. And if we fix those items, then you're going to fool yourself and thinking, wow, that looks like a new engine. And it really won't. But if I do enough detail and I change enough of the flaws so that they're disguised, then when you look at the engine, the overall image is going to make you feel good inside, okay? I mean, maybe most of us, all right? But I wanted a satin black for the parts like the radiator, the brake booster, the reservoir for the power steering fluid. This is pretty much kind of the factory sheen that I wanted to uh, try to get out of this. And then the other thing on the engine, I wanted more of a semi-gloss black, almost flat. So I experimented with a lot of different colors, a lot of different types of paints, you can see some of these are way too flat, some of these are way too shiny, and I finally settled on one. It was actually a mix. I had to take some engine paint, both semi-gloss and flat, kind of mix them together to get kind of the sheen I wanted on the engine block itself. As far as brushes, I've pretty much found that the smaller brushes work better. You're working on so many different tight areas, so many different varying surfaces to try to go in there with bigger brushes, when you're painting and detailing an engine block, you're gonna have problems because you're gonna get paint on stuff that you don't want paint on. But when you do go after your brushes, you want quality brushes that are real thick. You want real thick brushes with a lot of bristle that will hold a lot of paint. So when you go in there and dab those spots, you'll be able to get enough paint on and you'll be able to get it to flow out. Okay, let's go over to the engine and I'm going to show you how it looks now. We're far from being finished, but at least you're going to see what I did as far as painting the engine block and how it looks now compared to how it looked a few weeks ago. You'll have to admit that at least the engine block looks a lot better. You can see the areas I painted all up around the, the head here by the fuel injectors and all down the side as far as I could reach and then around here and then on the front of the engine block there. I used a very small brush when working around these in fuel injectors and the bolt heads because you got a lot of fine detail trying to not get paint all over these sensors and other various hoses and wires running through this area. So small brushes work very well here. Let me show you the front of the engine block. This really looks nice. Now, granted, it's not show quality, but when I get this all together and you look down in here, it's going to look really nice. Now you notice I had to do some masking here. There are some aluminum parts that you may not want to get paint on, and particularly the vacuum pump housing was a lot easier to mask off. And then using a small brush, I was able to work into all these areas. Once again, about the only place I could use a one inch or wider brush would be right in this area. So I pretty much found the smaller brushes work well when you're painting these engine blocks like this. I know some of you might be thinking, well, Kent, it's not perfect. Come on, there's a few spots you missed. Well, I don't want to spend that much time, okay? Now, you're going to have to decide this on your own. There's no extent to the amount of detail that you can do on an engine and in an old engine compartment like this. Once again, my goal is to get to about 85% of perfection because I found that perfection is usually an enemy of time, all right? So I've got the engine block painted. It's looking pretty good in here. I've got, still got some accessories that I have to paint, but now I'm gonna pull the valve cover and I'm gonna go after the aluminum, cleaning and sealing the aluminum. So when we come back next week, you're gonna see a huge change 
in the engine compartment. As I bring the camera in close after we've done the aluminum and some of the surrounding accessories. While I have the valve cover off, I'm going to do a valve adjustment and I'm also going to check timing chain stretch. Now I may show this in a different video, but at least I'll be able to tell you next week, hey, how does this chain look and how does the engine timing look internally? My favorite tool this week is my newly acquired rolling creeper. Check that out. Isn't that slick? It even has a tray here for tools. Let me tell you why I'm so impressed with this particular creeper. You know, it probably started out way back with cardboard and carpets. But about 15 years ago, I found this and I thought, wow, that's slick. It had a real tough plastic bottom. I was able to move it around on the floor and about two inches of foam really made for a nice padding for your knees. But the problem with this was I couldn't move it around very easily when I was kneeling on it. And then I found this rolling creeper and I thought, wow, this is great. And it really was for a while, but look what happened. Oops, broke. I think if you have one of these four wheel types, you need to make sure you keep your knees out on the edges, folks. I think I put my knees right in the middle and this thing snapped off. So recently I went on the hunt for a rolling creeper and look at this one. Look at how nice it is. It has six wheels, two in the middle here for support. It has these nice indentations for your knees. You can get down here when you're doing any kind of work on your car, in your garage, or out on your driveway. Let's say checking in here on your condition of your rotors, checking for thickness of pads, looking under the car, checking for oil leaks, and so on. This is a really handy tool to have in your garage. And there's also some other really good things that I can do with this tool around the shop here. This is the perfect tool for working on the newest member of my fleet. Let me welcome you to my newly acquired 300 SL roaster. Can you believe the condition of this? Look at the paint and the interior. I'm in the process of mounting a custom steering wheel right here and you can see, look at how hard it would be to work on this if you had to do it from a standing position. I had some good questions submitted this past week, so let's get to those now. The first is really two questions in one, so I'll kind of cover them together. Aviv writes, given the interest in LEDs, have you considered selling a full LED replacement kit for every available light bulb, interior and exterior, on the W115, W123, W124, and W126 chassis? As long as they match the original color, I see substantial demand for this given the obvious benefits. Well, Aviv, we're already working on that. In fact, before I got your question, I started working on it. This weekend, I ordered up about $200 worth of LED bulbs, all kinds of bulbs, bulbs to fit and work in the front turn signal marker lenses. And then you have a number of bulbs here in the tail light sockets, varying sizes with varying intensity. What I'm gonna do is get a bunch of these bulbs in and I'm gonna experiment with different intensity bulbs using the stock ones as a reference. So I'll take the tail lights, for instance, I'll put LEDs in the tail light and then I'll go outside when it's dark and compare that to the original. Then I'll come back in and change the bulbs. So it may take a week or two before we go through all the experiments, but I'm also working on dome light bulbs, license plate bulbs, uh, trunk light bulbs. So there's a lot of bulbs. This may take a while, but I just want you to know out there that we are gonna work on this and eventually I hope to have a complete kit where you can buy the kit with all the bulbs. We'll put some spares in so you'll have extras in case you have burnout. They have proven to be pretty reliable, but that doesn't mean you're not gonna have problems. So we'll do that. We'll provide the extra bulbs and then give you a complete kit. And I'm gonna do some video instructions on getting some of the lenses in and out. So it'll help you who haven't done a lot of bulb changes know how to do that replacement. Okay, the other question was related to LED bulbs. He was trying to do some experimenting on the bench with his instrument cluster, he wanted to know how I powered the light bulb sockets. Well, this isn't as easy as it looks. I'm gonna give you a clue, but because a lot of the clusters may be different in the way they're wired, this may not work for all clusters. But in the case of the W123 cluster that I had on the bench last week, all I had to do was bring positive power into the input side on the back of the potentiometer. Most of these are open, they have these brass type coated strips. So I just ran a sheet metal screw into the hole there that allowed me to connect the positive lead from my booster to that. 
And then I found the ground point. Usually on the cluster, you can find a ground point. It's located right here on the W123. Or you can even ground the other side, the clock and tack side, to the negative terminal on your battery booster, your battery, and power up your light bulb sockets. This will give you the chance to actually use the rheostat or the potentiometer to see how much they will brighten and dim. So <laughs> good luck. It may take some experimenting on your own particular instrument cluster. Now number two, this came from Caleb. He said, I recently bought a 1993 W124. I love the car. You were mentioning PM. <laughs> and at first I thought, what was I talking at night? Oh, I know what he's talking about. He's talking about preventative maintenance. And he said, you were mentioning PM on those older Mercedes Benzes. What PMs should I accomplish? Thanks. Well, this one isn't short and sweet, okay? There's a lot of areas that need to be lubricated from a preventative maintenance standpoint, not only lubrication, but other areas. So what I'm gonna be doing over the next couple months is going over this in my other series on buying a 1986, 1995 Mercedes Benz. I won't be covering this in the Kent's Garage episodes, but I will be covering it in this other series. And I'll actually come up with a printed list that you'll be able to download from my website. Now, I'm not gonna promise when this will be up because it's gonna be quite a bit of work, but I hope to be able to create that list and we'll go over that in some videos in terms of things that you wanna replace that could go bad in the car before they go bad. All the points of lubrication, many of which are not even covered in the Mercedes factory manuals. And that'll be all part of this ongoing series on preventative maintenance because you know out there that I'm a real fan of that type of maintenance. Now, the next question comes from Ken. He said, didn't you have a cup holder for the W126 that was in the console? And we did. In fact, we had for a while, we had a wood cup holder that sat right behind the shifter in that center console for both the W126 and the W123. And you've probably noticed if you visited my website that they've disappeared. Well, the reason they've disappeared is we just can't get somebody to build these that can keep building them at the quality we want and the speed we want, because there is quite a demand for those. So I just wanna throw this out there to you viewers. If any of you out there love woodworking and wanna make some nice wood cup holders that we can resell on my website, we'll be certainly happy to talk to you. I'll put a link in the show more part of this video or where you can email if you'd be interested in making cup holders for us, okay? Now, the next question is, and it also is two questions, and they're com I'm gonna combine them. And the first was, you mentioned lubricating a tilting sunroof. How do I lubricate the sunroof on my W124? Well, I don't even think I could answer that in an hour long <laughs> reply, uh, because I've done a complete set of videos on how to do this, it's over two hours long. So it's not something that's easily done. And the reason is you have to remove the sunroof panel to do proper lubrication. And this next question, which relates to this, he says, I have a 78123 non-tilting sunroof and the cable broke this past week. Due to poor lubrication, he was suspecting that. I only hear clanking on the C-pillar and no movement at all, even trying to move it with the emergency crank in the trunk. So if the cable is sheared or broken, even using the emergency method in the trunk to open the sunroof is not gonna work, okay? He goes on to say, all of the cable and sunroof removal guides online say I need to open it up a little bit in order to remove that headliner panel and to get the cable locking clip loose so I can you know, open the sunroof and get the cable out. Well, that's very true. In fact, my whole series of videos that I've done on the tilting sunroof as well as on manual sunroofs are based on the fact that I was frustrated a number of years ago not being able to find good information on how to repair these sunroofs. It starts with lubrication because if you're not lubricating these sunroofs, then they're going to fail. You're going to have broken angular tilting arms. You're going to have stripped cables. You're going to have worn out motors and you're going to have stripped motor gear drives and on and on it goes. And every time I pull one of these apart, <laughs> It's lack of lubrication, folks. So I'm going to show you now, this isn't a tilting sunroof, by the way, because I didn't have one available to show you, but I do have one that I recently removed from a W126 sedan, a 1981 model. And I'm gonna show you why you need to remove the sunroof panel 
in order to lubricate it properly. You cannot just go in there and smear some grease down in the tracks on your sunroof and expect that's going to do the job. Here you can see what the slide mechanisms look like after 30 years, okay? You can see how the grease gets really almost like tar and these felt pads, look at, look at what that looks like. I mean, it's just impacted with dirt and grease. So there's no way you can just smear grease on this. You actually have to clean this. If you're gonna reuse these pads, look at the amount of junk that's gonna come off the pad just by scraping it. I love these plastic razor blades for cleaning these sunroof guides because they don't damage the felt if you're gonna reuse it. But you can see, look at the amount of crud on there. And then you have plastic slides too as well that get all impacted with old grease. So you're gonna have to get all this off too and then re-lubricate everything. You're gonna have to use a brush and cleaners to get in there. It's the same on all four corners. And this is what I see every time I take one of these old sunroofs off. Now this is a non-tilting sunroof. The tilting sunroofs have a, a lot more mechanism and require even more, probably twice as much lubrication as the non-tilting sunroofs. I think you'll have to admit that was a great illustration of why you need to remove the sunroof panel in order to lubricate it properly, particularly if it's over 20 years old. Under 20 years old, you can probably get in there with a brush and smear some lubricant on the tracks, and that's certainly going to help. But when they get over 20 years old, they start building up that tar and gum and the pads get all impacted. So just putting grease down on the track really isn't gonna help. Now, if you're wondering where you get the information, to do this, I have a complete set of on-demand videos on my website about the tilting sunroof. I have manuals and also a video on the non-tilting, you know, manual sunroof like in the station wagons. And all these videos will help you to understand how to get the sunroof panel off and to get the parts lubricated properly. Now on the tilting sunroof series, in part one, I covered emergency panel removal. And I'll go through the sequence, it's pretty tricky, but I'll go through the sequence on how to get the sunroof panel opened up when the cable in the motor won't move it at all. If you can't get the sunroof open, you can't work on it at all. So that's really the trick. So just keep that in mind. If you're interested in my on-demand videos, you only need to watch part one of the tilting sunroof series because the procedure for getting the panel unstuck is real similar to the non-tilting sunroofs as well. So I hope that helps because I know a lot of you are having sunroof problems out there. Next question, do you own a G-Class or have experience with those cars? No, I don't. And once again, I get a lot of these questions, still get them every week. Hey, why don't you do videos on this car? Why don't you do videos on the AMG? Why don't you do videos on the, the R107? It's because I don't have these cars and I don't live with them. I don't have an opportunity to drive them and become familiar with them. I'm not just gonna go borrow some car and shoot a couple of videos and call that good, okay? That's not the purpose of what I'm trying to do with either my business or this particular series of episodes on YouTube. But I'm gonna throw this out there as well. If any of you have a car that you'd like to donate, if somebody has a, a G-Class they would like to donate to posterity, maybe it's got a blown engine or something, and you'd like to see it be remembered in posterity on YouTube, you're certainly welcome to contact me. And the same with some of these other chassis that I don't have. You know, it's really expensive uh, to do these videos, by the way, and it's even more expensive I have to go out and buy all these cars in order to shoot them. So, Donations are welcome, okay? Now the next question. From time to time I get answers to questions from other viewers. And if I feel the answer is appropriate, I'll go ahead and share it. And this one was thrown out there from Derek. He said, Ken, I think the episodes are just right. He said, I'd be happy for even longer episodes. And by the way, thank you for those who supported the longer episodes because I think this one is probably gonna be longer than the last one, okay? And he said, a couple more Questions and answers would be fine as well. But he said, as far as the W124 headlight wipers, I've taken mine apart a couple times to repair them. And this is what he says. He says, usually a little bit of grease on the cogs and motor will fix them right up, particularly if they're seized up. There we go again, lubrication. You're gonna help me keep hearing me harp and harp on this. Sometimes I need to do this as soon as possible after they've stopped. 
because they'll often seize up during summer as they only work when the lights are on. And that's true. If you're driving all the time, you're not turning the headlights on, you're not using the wipers, they're not going to exercise. And it's probably like air, air conditioning, you know, you need to exercise your headlight wipers some during the summer too. So I hope that tip helps. Later on, we'll go into some advanced diagnostics on these headlight wipers if I get a chance. And we'll bring one in the shop, take the motor apart and so on. Okay, number seven. And this uh, is a question concerning diesel engine timing. And he's concerned about how many degrees off the marks are on his crankshaft that show, he says, I got eight degrees off. Would a chain replacement correct this? Or if the timing is off that much, will a offset Woodruff key fix the problem? This is a huge subject. Timing chain stretch, when to replace the timing chain. What about these offset Woodruff keys? If your chain is badly stretched, often putting in a offset Woodruff key isn't gonna solve the inherent problem. You may want to replace the chain and then if there's any minor variation, then install a Woodruff key. And then some people are gonna ask, well, what about changing the sprockets? What about changing the guide rails? Don't you need, well, at that point, what about rebuilding the whole engine? <laughs> so there's a lot of opinions out there. There's a lot of false uh, recommendations about this whole subject. So I'm gonna cover this in a later episode. I may even cover it in a totally separate video. I think I'll take my 240D over there, open up the valve cover, and we'll videotape checking for timing chain stretch and show how that's done. But that's all going to be covered. Think about how you're driving the car. If you're driving the car a lot as a daily driver, you're driving it a lot at freeway speeds, high speed, 70 miles an hour. If you have eight degrees of stretch at this point, I would just replace the chain and the tensioner and go from there, okay? Now the last question comes from Peter. He says, I have an 82 Mercedes 300 SD. As I stopped at a red light, everything seemed normal until my vehicle would not move again. This happens in reverse, drive, and any other gear I place the shifter into. I looked over at all the vacuum lines and the shift linkage near the transmission, and they all look fine. Any suggestions? Okay. That's usually a bad sign, most of the time. If the transmission won't go into gear and you're moving the shifter, and he says he's looked underneath and the linkage is moving, the last thing you can check before you need to, uh-oh, uh got a problem here, is make sure the arm on the transmission is tight on the shaft going into the transmission. You follow me? That arm rotates a shaft which changes the gears inside the transmission case. Sometimes that bolt will loosen up. I've seen it actually fall out and that will allow the arm to move on the transmission and not allow the shaft to rotate to shift. Check that right away. If the shaft is moving, then you probably have some sort of catastrophic internal failure inside the transmission. All right, that covers the questions for this week. If you have a question, please leave it in the comments section of this episode and I'll consider it for next week. I'm sorry I cannot answer all questions. Once, Once again, I'm looking for questions that have a broad appeal, something that I can answer quickly. Now, you notice there were some in this episode I wasn't able to answer quickly, but if I can direct you to other resources, I may refer to that question because I know you still need help, even though I can't answer it in one or two a sentence, okay? So if you have a question, you know, once again, please leave it in the comments section of this episode and I will consider it for next week. I know if you watched last week's episode, you were expecting to see my white E320 coupe here in the shop getting ready to get the shock absorbers changed. Well, that didn't happen. I'll explain why in a minute, but I did get a chance to take it out on a road test. I shot a video on how to test for bad shocks. I'm going to post that video probably in about two days on YouTube. It'll be a separate video, but I had a lot of fun kind of demonstrating how I personally take a car and try to decide whether the shocks are good or bad. And in the case of this E320, they are definitely bad. So if you're interested in seeing that, just check out the video. I'll probably be coming up here on YouTube in a couple days. But the reason my S500 is back in the shop, I just solved the big problem I had. And you're going to say, well, Kent, how could you have a big problem? Well, 
let's say this is a hypothetical big problem. And what happened to me, I think happens to way too many owners of these cars, particularly if they're not diligent or not willing to consider doing some of the work themselves or even some of their own research on their own car. If you just take it into the dealer or take it into an independent mechanic and say, fix it, there's a risk. And I'm going to say there's a big risk to doing that. So this is what happened. I thought this would be interesting to do this little experiment. I had my fan in my S500 start making noise here about a month ago. And it gradually got louder and louder. And I could tell any time the fan cut on, you could hear bearing noise. You've, and this is one big monstrous fan. And it's driven by a separate motor. So there's actually a belt. You know, the, the motor mounts here. It would be like this. The motor mounts up here. And the belt drives this big fan. So it was making noise. And I knew that I was going to have to fix it. So I thought, well, I'll just ask a shop what they would charge. And they got back to me and said, well, if your fan is bad, we have to buy a brand new unit because parts are not available from Mercedes-Benz. You have to buy the whole thing, including the motor, and it will be $1,500, including labor. Now, can you imagine why so many people fall out of love <laughs> with these cars? Because... $1,500 to change my fan. And this is why I get a lot of these comments all the time. People say, oh, those Mercedes are way too expensive to fix. Well, they can be, but they can also be really inexpensive to fix if you're willing to roll up your sleeves, do some homework, and even if you don't do the work yourself, do some research, find out what the parts cost, find out what the alternatives are. So I said, no, eh, no thanks, I, I think I'll take care of myself. He says, well, we could shop around for a used one, you know, it might be half the price. As I did more research, I found out that most of these selling on eBay were selling in the two to $300 range. The OE price was anywhere from $800 to $1,200, and there were some aftermarket ones out there for six or $700. That still seemed like a lot of money. You know, I. <laughs> I want to save money like anybody else, okay? So I'm kind of cheap. So I went after this for the cheap, all right? And this is what I discovered. I discovered, number one, if you buy a used one on eBay for $200 or $250 and think you're getting a deal, think again. Uh, the history shows that a lot of these motors will wear out in the 100 to 120,000 mile range. This car has, you know, right, right in that range. And this motor started making noise. And I'm gonna post a separate video on how I tested this. It was kind of interesting how I actually determined it wasn't the fan, but it was the electric motor, because you could have bearing noise coming from the fan here or from the motor. So you need to determine which one it is before you try to go on the cheap. <laughs> and I still, I, the more research I do, anytime I get a used one, if I got a used one on a wrecking yard, if I got a used one on eBay, guess what? I'm gonna have a problem again you know, in a few months, because who knows what kind of mileage. And even if they stated the mileage, you have no proof that that's the actual mileage of the used part you're buying. So the first thing I did was start poking around about getting my old motor rebuilt, just having new bearings installed. But the more research I did about these motors, because this motor is turning on and off, on and off, on and off all the time, I decided that even putting new bearings in it may not guarantee long life. And I kept thinking, you know, there's got to be somebody out there that's just building the motor for a replacement. New. I'm talking new here. And sure enough, with a little research, I found the motor. And it just came in here a couple days ago. So that's why the old S500 rolled back into the shop. I was hoping to get this done in time for this particular episode and get it back out and get the coop back in here and start jacking it up to remove those shock absorbers. But it didn't happen because I had to spend all week building stuff, making tools, making testers, designing this, working on LED lights. I'm going, oh, oh, I'm getting tired, I'm getting old. I don't know how much longer I'm gonna be able to do this. You know, it's like, I don't have quite the horsepower. I think I need a good diesel purge maybe. But anyway, I only had one day one day to work on the 240D, and this whole episode is being shot in one day uh, very rapidly so I can get this up tonight, Tuesday night. So 
But I'm happy to report that I just saved $1,340, folks. Isn't that wonderful? That's like going to the casino and winning big. $1,340 I saved. And of course, you're saying, well, Ken, but you know these cars, and you're a mechanic, and you're doing all this. And OK, I, I understand. Yes, that's true. But I'm trying to make a point here. When people start complaining about these cars being way too expensive, the parts being way too expensive to fix, I'm not going to feel sorry for you because there are alternatives, okay? If you're willing to do the homework yourself and willing to do some research on your own before you fork over the cash to have somebody else fix your car. So I'm going to put this motor in and we'll go for a road test to report back, but I think I'm going to have a repair that's going to last as long as I will own this car for a little under $200. So if you enjoyed this week's episode, be sure to stay tuned for next week's episode. I would encourage you to support my channel. There's a support link on the home page of my channel. Any donations will be appreciated and will help to offset the costs of producing these videos. So we'll get that white coupe back in for next week. And we're going to keep working on that 240D. Just wait until you see what that engine looks like next week.